Of virtual worship. This is Pastor Gretchen Hope Wilson, and I'm so glad that you found us and tuned in to this wor virtual worship experience. You either came to our website at www.gmpc.net and that linked you over to our YouTube channel, or maybe you found us on YouTube, but we are grateful that you are here with us in worship today. I'm so appreciative to have one of the other pastors on our staff, the Reverend Dwight Blackstock, here with us today to assist in worship. We're also so pleased that Carrie Fletcher, our music director, can be with us to add music to our worship experience today. Scott Fletcher, who's one of our regular liturgists at Green Mountain Presbyterian Church, is here to help with some of the liturgy today. And John Walt, our tech guru, is helping with the recording and going to put all this together for us. And as always, we're grateful to have Fran Cook with us, our office administrator, who has been available at all hours of the day to help me during this tremendous time when we are seeking to be church in new ways. And so I'm so grateful to have all of them here with me today, helping us put this service together for all of us. As we keep saying, we are spiritually connected as brothers and sisters in Christ, even though we are physically apart right now. For we know that nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God that we know in Christ Jesus, our Lord. If you are listening or watching this worship experience prior to Sunday morning at 10 a.m., the 29th of March, know that you are welcome to join us for our Zoom worship time together when we share prayer requests, when we spend time with each other, catching up and hearing what is on the hearts of other brothers and sisters in Christ. You can find the link to that Zoom channel by going again to our website at www.gmpc.net. Or if you get the church email list, you probably received your connection newsletter, and that has information about the Zoom connection as well. So grab a cup of coffee or a cup of tea and come join us every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. in our Zoom time together for prayer and fellowship. We are grateful this day for the multitude of ways that you are keeping in touch with each other, that you're reaching out to friends and family during these times to let them know that even though we are practicing sheltering at home and social distancing, that we will not be a part of social isolation. We will keep each other close in our hearts through phone calls, through emails, through texts, through being present to one another. And I'm so proud to be a pastor at Green Mountain Presbyterian Church and to see the ways that you are taking care of each other during this time. So with all of that in mind, let us gather our hearts together to worship our wondrous God. Gracious God, we do hear you calling to us calling from uh, the world around us, a world of fear and, and of isolation, calling us to be with you in this time of worship and with one another. Call to us in ways that will enable us to understand uh, so that we can share fellowship with each other and have genuine worship of you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank 
join me. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with love upon you, that I may love what thou dost love, and do what thou wouldst do. As we enter more fully into worship, I invite you to hear these words from the prophet Isaiah. They who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. I invite you to take a few deep breaths Imagine the Lord is with you, even raising you up on eagle's wings above the fray, soaring. And given our virtual nature of worship right now, we thought a clear prayer of confession would be nice for all. As we prepare to come to this time of confession, I invite you to remember that the mercies of the Lord are from everlasting to everlasting and new each day. I will say a line from the prayer of confession and pause so that you have time to repeat it at home. And then I'll say another line, again, giving you time. Please join me. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. And we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and to walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. Take a few moments in silence for our own personal prayers and concerns. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is a short one from Matthew 6.12. I'll say it once, and you can join me a second time. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors.
scripture reading, which is also in Matthew's gospel, I want to talk a little bit about these times in which we are preaching. Some of you know that many years ago when I was working on a doctor of ministry in preaching with a dear friend, we created together a website called Preach With Me. And some of you participated each week, and we had brothers and sisters from other parts of the world. And we'd have a conversation about a scriptural text, what we thought was going on with it, or what it might mean in our particular context in Korea or in Zimbabwe. And I would take all of those pieces and, with God's help, weave that together into a sermon for Sunday morning. It feels like to me the days in which we are living right now as we shelter at home that we are in a time when we are preaching together in new ways. And I'm so grateful for the words that I'm hearing from you all who have been participating in the Lenten study groups on forgiveness, the texts and the emails you've been sending about how you're interacting with these texts. Please know that all of those things help us, help me when we come together to bring God's word into these days in which we are living. It is a new time of preaching together, and I'm so grateful for your communication with us in this time. I put my grandmother's quilt behind me today. It's a reminder for me of the power of being in Christian community. And I think especially about those at Green Mountain Presbyterian Church, and we're grateful for anybody who's not a part of our community on a regular basis that's choosing to be a part of our virtual community now. But we think about how different ones of us are different squares in the patchwork and the quilt that comes together. And this quilt being behind me reminds me that we are with each other, that you're with me and I'm with you during this time. And in addition to that, I have church directories here with me, and I refer to different pages and look at the pictures and think about the different saints during this time. And so it does feel to me that we are all in this together, and we are together around God's word. Our second scripture reading comes to us from Matthew, the 18th chapter, verses 23 and following. Let us listen then to God's holy word as it comes before us yet again this day. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave as he went out came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave! I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, the Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the privilege of being people of your word and being in your word together. We know that your word unifies us, both holy scriptures and your word, your only son. We are so grateful for the ways that we are drawn together in Christian community during this time. And we pray during this Lenten time as we continue down this road of forgiveness, 
that your spirit would be with us, equipping us and helping us as we learn to forgive others and also to receive forgiveness. So bless us with not just a hearing of your word this day, but a doing. We ask it in your holy name. Amen. I can remember as a child, whenever I would go to school and learn something new, I would be so happy to come home and show it off at the dinner table that night. And being the youngest, I was often behind. So whenever I was catching up with something and learning something at school, I was especially pleased when I could come home and show off a little bit. And I can remember in kindergarten days coming home and counting and using all my fingers and counting to 10 and being really proud that I could do that and then adding the toes in and getting up to 20 and then keeping on going and my mom would be so happy and proud when I could get all the way to 100 without any mistakes. We are counting people, right? We learn that from an early age when we learn our numbers, we start counting things. We as children maybe counted how many stuffed animals we had, or if our parent told us it was gonna be a certain amount of time until something happened, we might start counting the minutes, or in my case, I sometimes would count the seconds and my father would hope that I would soon stop. But the point being is that we learn early on to start counting things. The disciples, Peter and the others, were no different they knew how to count as well. And so we get these two verses ahead of this parable of the unforgiving servant that we just read, where Peter's trying to figure out how one counts when it comes to forgiveness. So Peter came and he said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times, Peter asks. Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. I'm guessing Peter was a little bit taken aback by that. To forgive once makes sense. Twice, if the person hurts you again, especially the same kind of person or offense, that's a pretty big deal. That's stepping up. And a third time, well, that would be quite generous. And Peter, I think, thought he was being generous and saying, how many times would I forgive? I, I know, Jesus, from things you've said that you expect big numbers. And so I'm going to double what seems kind of a lot already and add some to that. I'm going to go with seven. And into that setting, Jesus basically says, your counting is off, Peter. Try 77. And then from that place, Jesus goes on to tell this story, this parable of the unforgiving servant, this incredible story about the slave that has this debt that is absurd, actually, when you think about it. In the study group this past week in the section that we were reading in this chapter on forgiving, embracing freedom, the author goes on to help us. Now, remember, the first sum was 10,000 talents, 10,000 talents, and she tells us that a talent is about 15 years of labor. So we're talking 150,000 years of labor is the equivalent of this debt. It's absurd, right? No one could ever work it off in a lifetime. You couldn't be sold and that cover the debt. It's, it's an absurd, preposterous amount. And the next one is pretty tough too, though not the absurd level of the 10,000 talents. We get the one of the hundred denarii when he's being asked to forgive his fellow slave. A denarii is equivalent to about a daily wage, one denarius. So we're talking about three and a half months of labor that the one slave owed the other, so to speak. That one's not quite so absurd. But the king forgives that debt, the one that's the absurd amount. And on some level, I think what Jesus was saying, because that audience would have understood a talent and a denarii in ways that we do not, is that the way that God expects us to forgive is that absurd. It goes beyond counting. No, Peter, not just on your two hands less than, your number seven. It goes beyond what you could count in a lifetime. The truth is that's what we're supposed to understand about God, who is likely the king figure in this parable 
that God forgives us in ways that are absurd, that we can't count it, that it's just infinite and eternal and goes beyond anything that we can reckon or understand and defies all logic. The text gets tricky, I think, when we get down to the end. I don't know about for you, but those last two verses, and in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he could pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Tough verses that end this parable of the unforgiving servant. So if God is the king figure in the parable and we are the slave figures in the parable, what do we do with this king image of God that would send someone to be tortured for their inability to forgive a debt or unwillingness really to forgive a debt? Some people have suggested that maybe Matthew or another added this later and that it really wasn't a part of the original parable. I like that one because that, that simplifies that ending a lot. But I wonder if maybe it's also hyperbole. As absurd as the beginning of the story is with the 10,000 talents, I wonder if it's also meant to be this kind of absurd ending to the whole parable so that we begin to see that when it comes to God forgiving us, it goes beyond our comprehension. It goes to an absurd level. It's not something that we can truly count on two hands like Peter was trying to do. But I think it gets difficult when we get into this story at a deeper level and when we start looking at it in our own lives, because the truth is this is the real dilemma in my opinion when it comes to forgiveness. We both need to be about counting, we need to count things, and we need to not count. And that's where we get stuck. We need to count and we need to not count. Because part of the journey in forgiveness is recounting. When a wrong has been done you, another person hearing your story, especially the one who wronged you, and letting you recount the ways that you were wronged is significant. And so that becomes the dilemma for us on this forgiveness journey, that it is about counting. And then Jesus says, but at a point it goes beyond what you can count if you really want to be about the forgiveness work that we know from our gracious God. I think we get a sense of it this week in Thompson's chapter on forgiving, embracing freedom, when she gives us the story of Gary and Wayne. She gives us the story of these two men, and Wayne was a part of a situation where he was helping to hold up committing a robbery, really, against a motel, and Gary was working the front desk. And it happened in that particular crime scene that Wayne shot Gary at close range, and he suffered many injuries as a part of that, and it drastically altered his life from then on. Thompson goes on to tell us that Gary had nightmares, he had post-traumatic stress, it had tremendous impacts on his family and his life, and he just could not get beyond it. And so he finally contacted an organization because he believed that somehow, if someone could help mediate a conversation between him and Wayne, the one who had shot him, and they could meet as two human beings and tell their stories to each other, that he might be able to get over this hurdle in his life. What a powerful decision. And so he contacted a mediating organization to set up this time for him to be with Wayne and for them to be together. They were instructed when they sat across from each other to talk as human beings, man to man, person to person, and to begin to tell their stories. Gary listened to Wayne about what was going on the day that he committed that crime. But Wayne then also listened to Gary. He listened to him recount, counting the things that had happened in his life as a result of being shot by him. He sat and listened and took that in. And after the recounting, a new level of healing came. 
because after the counting and the recounting, they could let go of that and move to this level that is truly absurd, right? Where you quit counting and say, I have no need to count anymore. Because on some level, I think that's what Jesus is saying in this parable, is that true forgiveness comes at the point that you have reached a place when you can quit counting. Because then you've moved into this level where God is holding on to you and you know God's grace and forgiveness and mercy in ways that go beyond any of our ability as human beings to fully comprehend. So I wonder for us at this time in our lives on our own journeys around forgiveness, if it's time with somebody, in some cases, as Thompson points out, we have a not yet. The timing isn't right. But in other instances, it might be time maybe to sit with somebody and do some counting and recounting to truly hear their story and the details of it, because every part of it does matter for them and their healing or for us and ours. But then at some point to be able to let that go, to open our hands and our hearts and to release the need to keep counting so that God can take us to a new level. In this journey that we've been on in Lent on forgiveness, we've been talking about that truly one of the foundations of our Christian faith is forgiveness, this hard, hard work of forgiveness. But that undergirding that call to forgiveness is this understanding of God's love that is absurd and beyond counting and beyond conditions. And when we know that that holds us, we can move to a place of not judging others. We can move to a place of having known we are loved and therefore we can offer that love and grace and mercy to another. In these times as we negotiate being home more and pondering maybe more deeply our lives and what matters to us and what doesn't matter and what work God is calling us to do, forgiveness may be part of what God is asking us to do in this time and in these days. I've kept thinking about this Hindu story about a crow. And according to the story, this crow had a piece of meat in its beak and was soaring up high and some other crows noticed that it had the meat and they began to come after the crow, attacking it, trying to get the meat from the crow. And finally, the crow that had the meat relented and just dropped it. And then the group of crows that were attacking it dispersed, soaring to see if maybe they could grab the meat. And the story goes on that then the single crow began to soar higher into the sky and said, I lost the meat, but I have gained the peaceful sky. I lost the meat but I have gained the peaceful sky. May God help us in these days to gain the peaceful sky that comes from a heart centered in our wondrous God and a heart that knows the absurd love in which God loves us. May it be so. Alleluia. Amen. Join me in singing There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. And we'll do verse one two times. There's a wideness in God's mercy, like a wideness of the sea. There's a wideness in God's justice, which is more than liberty. There is no place where the sorrows are more felt than all in There is no place where our sailings have such kindly judgment. There's a kindness in God's mercy. By the wideness of the sea, there's a kindness in God's justice, which is more than liberty. There is no place where earth's sorrows are more felt than love in heaven. 
Let's join together in a word of prayer. Hear our prayers, gracious Lord, for our hearts are full and we need the solace that can only come from you. Our world is a very different place than what it was just a few short weeks ago, and we're striving to understand. But the truth is we don't understand. And many of us feel isolated, anxious, and alone. In this time of physical isolation, we rely even more on the peace of Christ that passes all understanding. And we ask that you would surround us and fill us to overflowing with the peace of Christ. Every day, dear Lord, we hear of people around the world who are infected and dying of this coronavirus. And no one seems immune from heads of state to those doing the most menial of jobs. And so we pray for all of those who are afraid and whose lives are threatened. But especially this morning, we pray for those who are frontline servants. We pray for doctors and nurses and orderlies and chaplains. We pray for people who have put their own lives on hold to minister to those who are ill. We pray for those who live alone and whose isolation is intensified by stay-at-home orders. Grant your church the wisdom and the inspiration to find meaningful ways to reach out to them. We pray for those whom we know and love who are ill and perhaps in recovery. We pray for those recovering from surgeries like Jill and Nancy. We pray for others like uh, a brother and sister-in-law who are suffering uh, different kinds of ailments. We pray for Charles who may be moving soon. We pray for Don's family and for other families who might want to travel for an Easter visit. We pray that you'll help them to know when it is safe. God of grace, in our time of physical separation, knit us together with strong bonds of love. Help us to be even a stronger family today than we were just a few weeks ago. We pray in the name of our brother and our savior, Jesus, who taught his disciples a prayer we call the Lord's Prayer. Uh, now join me for that prayer, wherever you might be. Let us pray. My Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now's the time in our typical worship service when we would celebrate birthdays. And as we have been saying in recent weeks, think about somebody that's having a birthday. If you received your Connections newsletter, you can look there to see about recent birthdays. Maybe reach out with a card or a call and let them know that you're thinking about them and celebrating the day that they were born. Even this week, some of our members have given additional gifts to help others in our community in times of need, and I continue to be so humbled by the generosity of this community. 
we would oftentimes take up a financial offering following the birthday offering. And we are grateful for those within our community who continue to give faithfully to the church. We are also grateful at this time for those who have picked up food and made deliveries or run errands for others within our community. For those who've sent emergency assistance for those who have lost jobs. For those who are reaching out to service personnel that are a part of their lives and giving an extra gift to them and saying, no, I'm thinking about you and I appreciate you. Invite you to use this time to think about the resources that God has given you, the gifts of time, treasure, talents, and to see if during this particular time, there is something that God is asking you to do to bless another. May God help each one of us to continue to be faithful. A variety of announcements for you again, Sunday morning, March 29th at 10 a.m. We will have our Zoom community prayer time together when you can lift up personal and specific prayer requests. We'll also have a time of fellowship together. You can find out more information about that on our Facebook page or on the website at www.gnpc.net. Or if you're receiving emails from us in your connections newsletter. You'll get all the information about how to dial in by phone or to link in on your computer to the Zoom station itself. And so we look forward to seeing you on Sunday morning. I would highlight for you that in your connection newsletter, you have received information about a Monday, Thursday service of shadows that you can do at home. Also in the newsletter, there's information about the prayer vigil that we are offering from Holy Saturday into Easter morning. We're grateful for Patricia and Richard Hoffman and their willingness to coordinate those signups for the prayer vigil. There's half hour segments that you can sign up to be in prayer, starting with sundown on Saturday night until sunrise Easter morning. And we look forward to being in prayer together as a community. If you sign up to be a part of that prayer vigil, know that we will send you a guide that you can use during that time to help with your time of prayer and your reflection. Please continue to check the website, www.gmpc.net, for updates and for other things that are happening. And of course, know that your deacons, your pastoral staff, we are here for you. Please, we will stay in touch with you, but stay in touch with us. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you deep and abiding peace, both this day and forevermore. Alleluia. Amen.